Welcome to this month's Insights interview from the Payments Association. I'm Tony Craddock, I'm the Director General here. The first time I met this month's VIP guest, he was presenting uh, at a prepaid financial services conference in Canary Wharf, must have been oh, 15 years ago or so, and I was struck by his clarity and his candor and, and about how we have to focus not on the products or the technology, but on solving problems. That was very much his mantra. And he's, he's been following that mantra by launching several payments companies and doing what most entrepreneurs dream of, uh, selling them uh, through at a healthy exit. Now, I must say his uh, latest venture uh, um, is truly groundbreaking. I love what he's up to and, and it goes to the root of one of the society's biggest problems. So to tell you more about that and his success secrets, please welcome the founder and CEO of Payall, Gary Palmer. Tony, thank you for the introduction. My only uh, one correction is we met over 20 years ago. I'm was sad it really? to admit it's been that long ago, but wow, yeah, wow. it's been over 20 years ago. Goodness me, time flies. Time really flies. Well, look, let, let's kick off right away. At the start of every one of these uh, Wall of Fame Insights interviews, I ask my, my guests how they stay motivated and kind of what keeps them going the extra mile when faced with balancing, challenging jobs and, and home and work lives and things. This is particularly relevant for you. Um, uh, you're operating a global business, um, uh, solving a global problem, and you have offices, family and homes in different parts of the world. So what is it, Gary, that continues to motivate you day in, day out? Tony, there's not one thing. I have always found that I love making a difference from my very first job to what we're doing now. Uh, being relevant, I've never tried to find a way to become famous or be in the spotlight. I've never even had a Facebook account. I never will. Uh, I don't have Instagram. Uh, I'm an intensely private person, but I, I draw great pleasure and motivation and satisfaction from being able to have a positive impact uh, not only in my business, uh, with my business, with the customers that we support, but with almost anybody in my life. I enjoy the the authenticity of relationships, the messiness of life, uh, and life and business and fun. These things, to me, all merge together. And so mm -hmm. it's just sort of who I am. There's not any one thing that keeps me going or keeps me excited. Yeah, well, that's nice. And I certainly that resonates with how I know of you as being you're always full on flat out with with most things. But but the, there's kind of the difficulty most entrepreneurs have is is working out. So what's their path going to be? And and and, and I, some of them say to me um, that they feel like have a North Star that guides them on their way. Um, and one of those things may be how you define success Can you, in the audience, how you define success. I don't think about it, uh, uh, Tony. I, I uh, you know, thinking about sort of a north star or what motivates me, I'm more inclined to think about uh, perhaps how I was raised and the influences that may have had on the person I am and, and always have been. But I can't put any, I can't point to any one thing and say this is my north star. Uh, you know, I was raised in a home with with a father who worked in an aluminum factory uh, for more than 20 years. And the fact is, is that most factory workers work eight hours a day, five days a week, 40 hours a week. But my dad literally for the 20 or 25 years I can record, say, from, from, from the, my entire life living at home, he never worked less than 16 hours any day. He literally, it's called overtime in a factory, and he works 16 hours every day. I had three younger brothers, and my mom helped raise the kids, of course, when your father's away working those many hours. And so she was sort of the uh, the shuttle bus taking us to all of our activities. Mm -hmm. But I was also very active on the farm. My three brothers were younger than I am. So a lot of the responsibility for the farm chores, the farm work fell on me. We had over 112 acres. We had 50 or 60 head of cattle. Most people don't know that about me, that I was raised mm. on a farm in a very mm. simple part of the United States. But this idea of uh, sort of getting up early and working hard and getting your hands dirty has never 
been a bad thing to me. I enjoy it. I like it. Mm -hmm. And so even now in, in my company today and in all of my companies, I'm intensely involved in the product definition and uh, uh, product development. I, I'm not a big fan of of outsourcing vision and product strategy. I think CEOs, I think for me, at least anyway, that's who I am. I have mm. to live with my customers and the problems that they face and understand mm. their goals and what defines success for them. I think mm. maybe that's the way of thinking about how I think about your question is, in everything I do in my business, I try to understand what are the challenges the customer faces? What are the, their goals? And how do I make sure I help them achieve their goals? Because their success ultimately leads to my success. Mm, that makes sense. Now, look, your mom and dad, um, are they still with us? Sadly, my mom passed away about seven or eight yeah. years ago from a, a very, very difficult uh, bout of cancer. And this was her second experience with that. My dad is in his 80s. He's still with us. He's healthier than I am. He he does wow. push-ups every day and <laughs> walks five miles. And he's a, a an incredibly uh, fit and amazing person. In fact, you know, you asked about my mom and dad. My my dad is by far one of the most humble people I've ever met. He's the, one of the most selfless people that I've ever met. And my mom had those those traits of selflessness as well. We. Uh, I lived in a very uh, faith-centered uh, home, and uh, we had this massive farm where we raised and uh, for everything from tomatoes to corn to cucumbers, and we canned hundreds and hundreds of quarts of those every year. And she always gave 10% to the church, which is a concept in many uh, faiths mm -hmm. called tithing. But she also mm -hmm. went more, she did a lot more than that. She would uh, find people that were struggling and show up at their homes with food. And we were the ones drag, being tracked along as kids to show up and carry these big boxes of canned vegetables into their homes. So I lived in a home where my parents uh, were not, uh, uh, they, they didn't go to university. They were not in high paying business jobs, but at the core of our family, were values that uh, I would never replace. And that experience growing up, I would never want it any other way. And in fact, I struggle and long for that with my kids and how to try to ensure that they see the, the values uh, that we have define us much more than anything else, much more than wealth or education or career. But it's truly the values that define who we are. That's so, so true. So true. Would you, would you, dad now look at you and say you know what i always knew you were going to make it or, we never or, talked or, about I, you know i don't know we, we've never really talked about it they've just always been a huge supporter of me from yes. the time i was a kid saying you can do anything but they always said get educated get educated and work hard really? and I, I think there's some truth to that yeah i mean i've yeah. uh you know in my first company we interacted with um one of my investors was a professional athlete in the U.S. And through getting to know him and his colleagues, I met another professional athlete. And he used to say to me, Gary, it's not about working hard. If you want to succeed in this in this sport and that I'm in, if you want to succeed in business, you got to work harder than anybody else. You know, so it wasn't even about working hard. You have to work harder than everybody else. And I think there's a lot of truth to that. I, I would say that uh, I've always, even before I started my first company, I looked to entrepreneurs and I wanted to have my own business, but I had no idea the sacrifices and the hard work that it would take. And once mm -hmm. I did it the first time, I was sure I'd never wanted to do it again. But yeah. I found out at the conclusion of that, I love it. And I want to keep doing it over and over and over again. Yeah, there's an irony, isn't it? There? The people who love being yeah. an entrepreneur and are good at it, they, they, they once they've done it, and it's kind of like, the exit is normally a, a really important milestone. They go, okay, well, so what next? And 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 this was what was fascinating. Let's talk a little bit about the early stage of your career. I'm not going to go back to the very beginning, although maybe you can tell me what was your first ever job. I well, I worked on our farm, but it was kind of an unpaid job. And then yeah, the second yeah. thing I did was an entrepreneur. We had a large tractor, uh, and I would go to the farms in our in the in, in the like a five mile radius of our farm. And yes. offer to either plow gardens or wow. uh, cut uh, hay for farmers. Uh, I sold seeds door to door uh, for for wow. gardens. Uh, and my first paying job 
where I wasn't like doing it myself. I was a lifeguard and at a swimming pool. Uh, mm-hmm. We I lived in a cold part of the U.S., but we had this swimming pool that had uh, enclosures on it, and I love water. So yes. uh, my first paying job was a lifeguard, and it wasn't easy to get that job, by the way. Yeah, I bet. I bet. How exciting. What a great, what a great opening. And I love your story about working on the farm or working for the family. So look, you took you took this um this sort of strong grounding of values and 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 graft from, from your parents and and then and you, you got to a point at which you started um a company called Wildcard Systems. Um you sold that um for $262 million when the company that bought you e-funds was worth about 900 million just under a a billion dollars and then just over two years later you sold that to fis for 1.8 billion doubling the value of e-funds in in about two years that's an extraordinary thing to achieve what what can you tell us a bit about why did you start it what was it that encouraged you to flip it and then how you then transitioned to to the next exit, double, double the value. How did that happen? So, yeah, it's a great question. And uh, I will say this, that uh, if I had to do it over again, knowing what I know today, I would probably have advised myself not to do it. And I have to temper, uh, yeah, I have to temper sort of now my uh, pattern recognition and my experience when I'm speaking with younger entrepreneurs to not give them such bad advice. <laughs> but the fact <laughs> is, is that when I started Wildcard Systems, um, I didn't know what I was doing. I had experienced, uh, I was being relocated from uh, Tampa, Florida to the Fort Lauderdale, Florida area and experienced a home break in in Tampa that they caught the kids who were in my home and stole everything. Mm -hmm. And then the insurance company, rather than send me a check for the TV, the VCR, the camcorder, the things that were stolen, they subcontracted with a local company to replace the items that were lost or stolen. At the time, I worked in the district office of a retailer that sold everything that had been lost or stolen. So I mandated this little company, this replacement company that worked for the insurance company, buy the stuff from me. That led me down a path where uh, it was a bad experience with them and wasn't a particularly positive experience of them buying from our company. But it just led me to think of this idea that if I'd been given a payment card and I could have used that to upgrade and downgrade. And maybe it didn't work at a liquor store or travel agent. It only worked at the places I was supposed to shop at to replace those items in my home. That would be a nifty sort of product. Mm. So I began researching this idea of using a payment card in the context of property and casualty insurance claims, but it wouldn't work everywhere. So that was the foundations for how uh, pay all got started what i or sorry what wild uh, uh, for the starting for the beginning of wildcard systems what i never imagined as a young kid who's 29 or 30 is how hard it is to build software mm. how hard it is to sell to insurance companies and then not knowing how the card industry works that you got to sell to banks and visa and mastercard first so all of those things together created a really difficult early stage of the company but i never give up And I knew there was value being created, both for me and for consumers who would use this, as well as for the insurance companies. And so that was the sort of the seed that began uh, Wildcard Systems. But we very quickly realized in interacting with Visa, MasterCard, and banks, there were a lot of other use cases. And so we built the first ever issuing processing platform for prepaid cards that was built using open APIs that allowed third parties, whether it's an insurance company, a payroll processor, an incentive company, a travel company to integrate. And typical credit and debit card processing platforms were not built that way. And we also built it in the late 90s, not from 96 to 99 when we got started, distributing applications or business services over the internet. This little thing called the internet at the time was basically used for porn. Uh, That was also a very controversial idea that we're distributing business applications online. So we broke through a lot of barriers at the time that are very, were very difficult. And uh, when you kind of turn back the clock, but I love it. It was a challenge that there was always uh, sort of an obstacle in front of us. There was always, yeah. we're not going to make this. You're going to run out of money. But I kept going. So I think my, my observations about this are, number one, 
you didn't choose payment. Payment sort of chose you. You know, you were out solving a problem using one solution and that didn't work. So you 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 chose something to do with payments. The second observation is that actually because you were from outside the domain of payments, you could do things in a way in which they weren't done. So nobody could turn around and say, that's just not how we do things around here, because you had to invent it from, from scratch. And then and then this third, the third thing I, I'm observing is you kind of didn't get it right first time. You had to <laughs> had to change and change and change. And that and, and you know that that in itself is, is fascinating. Tony, it's a, a it's a very astute observation. The fact is, if you fast forward to today, what we're doing at Payall, uh, we are completely changing an industry. And I won't get into it at this point in the conversation, but I'm facing and I have faced the very same challenges that I faced 25 years ago where they said, that's not how we do it. It doesn't mm -hmm. work that way. You can't do that. Mm -hmm. That's impossible. Mm -hmm. The only good news is, is having done that or gone through that process several times and heard those same stories being uh, told to me that this is not how we do it. But knowing if you're true to making changes that are positive for everybody in the ecosystem, and they're logical and they're bite-sized changes that you can actually execute, that if you stay with it and you adapt and pivot where you need to refine the value proposition or make sure you're being true to what you set out to do, you can still do it. So those very, or it's an interesting observation that you've made, but the same principles that sort of uh, that I had to deal with or that existed way back in the 90s are still faced, we're still facing today. Yeah, and, and you just kind of answered the question I was going to ask about your guiding principles, because the, the, the things you've just explained would seem to be consistent through your career. Is there any other, any other kind of particular guiding principles you might like to share with the audience before? And then we're going to go and talk about your, your business. Yeah, I think the, beyond what we've just been talking about, when you actually try to build a company and deliver products, there's one thing you got to get right. And that is you have to have great people around you. In all of my companies and, and our successes and our difficulties, but certainly as we've grown and succeeded, it, would, it didn't happen because of me. I learned a long time ago that uh, my imperfections get magnified in leadership positions, but I, they are, they're also sweetly and gently covered by amazing colleagues and friends and partners <laughs> who uh, are much better at many things than I am. And without a doubt, I would say to anybody uh, that if you get the people part of your business right, hiring, developing, growing, trusting, motivating, and correcting at times, people uh, who mm -hmm. come to you with this capacity of uh, overachieving and being passionate about being perfect and getting it right for your customers and being true to this idea that none of us are truly perfect and we're always learning and growing and they're willing to leave egos aside and invest the energy and the heart that's required, you can build a great company, but you got to get the people ingredient right and in your business. Yeah, yeah, it's so fundamental, and and I and 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 it's so difficult. It's quite interesting. I've, I, are you? I, you probably don't have much time for watching television. Have you? Are you a Netflix subscriber? Do you watch? Have you watched Succession or any of it? I haven't. I mean, I'm embarrassed to say I watch very little television. Yeah. I mean, I'm embarrassed. All of my friends use uh, Game of Thrones references, and they started years ago. I've never even seen one episode. I am. I mean, I'm sorry to say I, I don't watch much TV. No, I'm sure you don't. But there was there's a particular character there who is, in fact, a lot of it's about battles for power, and it's it's based on it's it's modelled on Rupert Murdoch, um, and and his very his his dynasty of family. But um, I was going to going to simply ask you about how you handle power, because as a or as 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 a as an industry leader, as a company leader, you have authority, you have status. And those things tend to go with power as well. How do you make sure you don't abuse the use of or abuse, misuse it? You know, I, Tony, I've never felt like I'm in a position of power or status. I, it's <laughs> never entered my mind. In fact, I I genuinely feel like I'm a servant. I, and I've, if you look at some of the org charts in my companies, customers are on top. Yeah, and nice. the people that are facing with our or working with our customers on a face-to-face -face basis, they're at the top of the org chart under our customer. I'm at the bottom. Yes. My job and the board's job is to make sure we're supporting everybody in the organization 
who has a much harder job than I do, their job is to interact with our customers and build the kind of relationships that are based on trust, keeping our commitments and promises that lead to ensuring our customers succeed. So mm-hmm. I truly, and this, this, you know, I'm not a big fan of using sort of contemporary buzzwords to make a point, but I really am a servant to our employees. My job mm-hmm. is to help them succeed. That's it. Yeah, brilliant. Brilliant. And that, and that shines through, I think, in the people I talk to on your team and the way in which you work. Look, let's, this has been a great background about you. Thank you for being so open and authentic. Let's move on and talk a little bit about our industry, uh, because as you reminded me 20 years ago, you were talking about being a problem solver. And, you know, our industry has developed over the last 20 years you know, to work in an increasingly secure, low cost way that helps people pay and get paid day in, day out. And, and, and yet one of the main challenges that we still face is our ability to send money between people and businesses in different countries and different currencies and continuing to do that cheaply, quickly and securely. I, I, I've often seen it as, if you like, the final frontier in payments. Can we talk a bit about that? Can you share with us why you think it's still such a big problem? Yeah, I can. I, I mean, it, um, it comes down to banks not having the right software and the right processes to make payments safe, transparent, and efficient. Mm. And that's at the root of it. And let's just let me pause for a second and give just kind of put this into context. You think about when Swift was created in the early '70s, and today when we imagine cross-border payments, we oftentimes fixate on Swift as a, uh, and oftentimes is misunderstanding what it is and what it isn't. But remember, think about the 1970s. We had a little thing called the Soviet Union that we had just finished a terrible war in Southeast Asia. Mm. There were dictators in South America, and there was no such thing as a global economy. Now, kind of pause for a second and say, okay, well, we started to move into a global economy where we we began uh, to recognize the need to move money around the world. So how do we do that? Well, first, it started uh, with central banks and their foreign currency reserves. That was the only way to enable local liquidity and to enable the conversion of one currency to another. Mm -hmm. On top of that, so fundamentally, if you look at that condition 50 years ago to today, they're radically different. Now we have you know, 150 trillion, some say it's as low as 120, some say it's 170, 180. But the global economy and cross-border trade is, you know, call it $150 trillion. And outside of central banks, there are dozens of models of foreign currency trading paradigms that now replace that original central bank model. But remember back in the 1970s as well, if you were in the United States and wanted to call Paris, it was like 10 or $15 a minute to mm. make that phone call. Mm. And the phone got disconnected every couple of minutes. Yes. So how do you transmit data? I mean, we didn't have the internet. We didn't have Wi-Fi. We didn't have all of these things we have today. And SWIFT was created in that environment where we needed a stable way to route messages, a safe way to route messages between financial institutions. Many of these financial institutions were using core bank systems that don't look anything like core bank systems today. And in fact, in some cases, they were largely manual. So mm-hmm. SWIFT emerged from this need, this, this re- business need to have a secure, safe, stable way for banks to, to message each other and to tap into that liquidity from those central banks and see if they could do it. So mm-hmm. that was the early days of cross-border. But if you fast forward to today, and now we've got a very uh, modern alternatives to uh, dialing someone on a landline phone, we have uh, massive alternatives and new paradigms for liquidity and foreign exchange, foreign currency trading. But you know what? we still struggle with. It's at the core of the bank, there's a thing called a core bank system, or there's a digital bank platform. And these systems, they've changed a lot. And when you think about the evolution of payment products and banking services, but in the area of cross-border payments, 
they haven't changed that much. And that's where we come in. We, we analyze, I analyze really at the genetic level, what is it about cross-border payments that cause them to be inefficient and slow and for everyone to struggle when they're making or receiving cross-border payments or to not have the kind of experience that we have in the domestic market. And so we're on a mission to bring uh, the speed, safety, and transparency that we all appreciate and respect for domestic payments to the cross-border payment world. And that's what we're doing. Brilliant. Very clearly explained, and thank you. And and built on built on a flawed, no, a, a model developed in a different era. It suggests that uh, the, in today's era, you need another different model. Well, Tony, let me get very specific. So, if you're a bank and you want to, or you're an EMI or a PI or or a, a proper properly regulated entity that you want to offer cross border payments. You have to go to your regulator with a business case, with a business plan, where you're describing your policies and procedures and who your partners are and how you're going to execute that. Now, if you're in the paradigm of 50 years ago and you're a bank in another country and you want to facilitate clearing inbound payments that are originated from outside of your country, you got to do the same thing. You go to your regulator with a business case, with a business plan, with your policies and procedures, how you're going to sign up these foreign institutions, how it's all going to work. Tony, can you believe that in both of those instances, the policies and procedures, and they're on different sides of the transaction, the policies and procedures, whether it's compliance, risk, or operating procedures, they're largely manual. So if I'm an originating institution and I make and I offer cross-border payments to my customers. So one of my customer presses send. And by the way, I'm not going to name the biggest banks on the planet, but let me ask you a question. When you when one of their customers presses send on a website, you and it's a, a large payment or uh, it doesn't really matter the size. Believe it or not, there are human beings in the back office of that bank that are receiving that payment. And in mm. most cases, they're looking at their in internal policies, procedures, risk compliance rules. Some of those are integrated with the local regulators' rules, and then they're executing, executing them. So what does that mean? Well, if I'm a bank in Brazil and I offer my customer cross-border payments and my customer press is sent on a website and the transaction is $252,000, the equivalent of that, an order goes to the back room of the bank and a human being says, oh, it's more than this amount of money. I need a bill of lading, a customs declaration, and an invoice to satisfy either my internal policies or an external regulator. You know that happens manually hundreds of thousands of times well, it's, well, it's, a week. It's no it's no wonder that it's expensive. That's exactly, it's slow too. So imagine, when does that call go to the customer that say you need to do this? Maybe it happens the same day, but usually it's several days later, or it happens mm -hmm. when that customer calls the bank saying, well, my money didn't get there yet. Why is it taking so long? <laughs> and so that's, what, oh, we've been busy. Let me, let me kind of, here's what I need from you. But here's the, again, at a, from a customer level, when they press send on a website, they think the money went flying magically through the internet. The fact is, based on the, the class correspondent banking model, his bank, that customer's bank, has already deposited tons of money in that correspondent bank or in that system. So the money's already there. It's just all of these manual policies and procedures aren't system, systemized. Yeah. They're not digitized. And the same way on the other side. So if you're a, cor a correspondent, you're, you're a bank in a country that signed up banks around the world to receive inbound payments, you've signed up hundreds of banks around the world, perhaps, and you've done due diligence on the bank to ensure they have good AML and KYC policies. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But one of the things that's missing, and again, it goes to this concept of software, is you have no idea who their customers are. You have no idea who's originating the payment. You have no idea what sanctions checks or EIDV has been executed on them. You don't know mm -hmm. what their commercial activity is. Mm -hmm. you, are, you, you, don't, you don't know why they're paying someone in your country. You are trusting that they are that the bank has good policies and procedures in place. Now, we always say, well, we've seen evolutions in the SWIFT messaging protocol and we've got more data in there. Yeah, but it's not enough. And most core bank systems and most digital bank platforms, they're not they haven't been adapted or they haven't adopted that technology spec yet anyway. And what do they do with it? If I'm a bank in the United States and I'm receiving an inbound payment from anywhere in the world, where do I put that data? 
And I've got to have software and systems and technology in place to allow me to receive and manipulate that data. Mm -hmm. So at the core of cross-border payments, what's missing is software for financial institutions to automate their business processes, automate their compliance and risk products processes, and then software to safely and legally share that data, and then software to intelligently execute a requested payment using all of that data in the authorization algorithm, and then to release that payment out into the wild, but not just to a bank account. Because in some countries, only a very small percentage of the population have a bank account. Mm -hmm. So if you really want to deliver services on a global scale, you got to allow payments to go to digital banking, digital wallets, mobile money, mm -hmm. cash pickup. Mm -hmm. And these are the sorts of things that are a part of, of what we believe are essential for a bank to really have a great modern cross-border product. So, so that's what you're taking to the banks and saying, you can have some of this. We've developed it. It's fit for purpose, ready to go. Um, and it can solve these specific problems for you and for your customers. Makes a lot of sense. And how's it That's going? exactly you, right. Whether you, you're originating whether you're originating a payment or you're operating in the old fashioned way of clearing a payment, we've built software that allows you to preserve the infrastructure you've created around foreign currency trading and foreign currency liquidity, but bolt on this ability to automate all of these processes and to bring transparency to what is otherwise an opaque, high risk business. Brilliant. Now, look, I, I, I promised myself I wasn't going to allow you to talk too much about your business because anybody, any, anybody, anybody who knows you knows you've got a great proposition and a well worth talking to, and I'm sure they will. But they want to hear from you about you and your views okay. on certain things. So one of the things you've decided, you've always been a community guy. Um, one of the things you decided, uh, for, first of all, I know you've been cooking this for a couple of years and you've you've you've, buck, you've thrown a huge amount of, of, was it $10 million you've put into building this back end? No, we've raised over 15 million so far with 15, amazing okay. uh, financial sponsors and investors. Superb, superb. So um, you've also decided to become a benefactor of the Payments Association and you're supporting our cross-border cross uh, uh, stakeholder working group. Can I ask you why you've done that and what you're hoping to get out of that role? Yeah, this, you know, anytime you're, what I learned a long time ago from my early days of prepaid is that one person and one company can't change an industry. It literally takes one person who affects another, who affects another, who affects another. So, so it takes uh, a, a lot of people who are learning about what are the root causes of uh, these the things that we're facing, the inefficiencies, uh, what in some countries are laws or regulatory concerns that may need to be massaged in order to really have a breakthrough product and so I think the Payments Association is the ideal environment for us to come to the table and explain uh, contextually some of what I kind of rambled through a minute ago, <laughs> but really trying to get those who are involved in cross-border payments at any point in the ecosystem, whether they're a regulator, a foreign currency trader, or they've decided to compete with financial institutions, or you're a bank, an EMI, or PI, to really bring a thoughtful explanation to how cross-border payments work and to bring to the surface that the, the old-fashioned way of doing business, which has been around for 50 years, isn't sustainable in the new world. And so what we wanted to do through the association is really bring uh, this thought to the table, but we also wanted to listen and learn. I am absolutely confident, and I've been uh, humbled and delighted by the fact that uh, through our interactions and through interaction with other association members, our thinking is evolving and improving every day. Wow, that's so wonderful. So this yeah. input and this feedback is so important to us getting it right and making sure that our product roadmap goes down the goes in the direction that the users need. And I, I think through that symbiotic process, we end up with getting a better future to happen sooner, and and that's the that's the wonderful joy about working in a way that reflects that people feel they're stronger together, they can move things forward faster, better. It's it's great. And so, and again, thanks for your support on that. You mentioned the word sustainability. We're going to briefly touch on that. And then we're going to cut to, you talked a bit about change. We're going to cut to your top tips for, for, for people joining the industry, but talk a little bit about sustainability. This is something that's on everybody's agenda. What are we doing and 
is it working and what else do we need to do more of? Tony, I'm not an expert on this, and I don't want to sort of pretend to be or invoke any sort of wisdom around this. Uh, what I can say is that in the context of uh, watching the payment system, payments industry and systems evolve over the last 50 years, is that our industry has collectively, I think, been uh, a very influential force in driving efficiencies and the use of modern technologies, which by largely by definition moves to a more uh, greener world, not in every case, but certainly uh, in, from, from some of the things that I've seen, moving to digital payments versus card and paper and, uh, or, and other forms are very helpful in this process. I agree. And, and I think well, I, I did some work on the costs of the friction that the payments industry puts into international trade and and the cost of the cost of paying for things that themselves are moving around the world, not so much services, but products um, uh, and, and goods is, is about three yeah. percent. So how, you know, through the, the professional services required to do the bills of laden and the, and the letters of credit and things and the banking system that's behind it. And I'm and I've always thought, well, if you could shave a, you know, a third of that off, then just think about how much more liquidity is released into the world and how much less friction there is to people trading internationally. Tony, I agree. And I let me get very personal about it as well. Imagine uh with remittances or small value cross-border payments where if it's a hundred the equivalent of a hundred dollars or two hundred dollars or three hundred dollars payments if the cost of facilitating that transaction is consuming five ten fifteen dollars mm -hmm. maybe it doesn't seem like very much but in many parts of the world it's a lot of money yeah yeah it has yeah. the ability to change families and change communities so we're committed, and, and it's really important as a part of who we are, that we're enabling these far more safe and efficient payments so that financial institutions can deliver the products in a more efficient way, and by extension, improve our planet, improve the mm -hmm. financial well-being of families that are hardworking in villages around the world, all the way to enabling large corporations to save money to hopefully reinvest in their businesses and their people. So I, I, I agree with you completely that our industry has done a lot, but there are still things we can do. And it's what uh, we're motivated here to do. That's very cool. That's very exciting. You're, that's why you're such a good community community player. So look, finally, we've I mean we've run out of time. I can't believe that half an hour's gone very quickly. You're, you're, just imagine, lots of young people will be looking at you as the if you like the um, the uh, Logan Roy, the the kind of the the the, the industry leader, the the entrepreneur. Um, if somebody comes to you and kind of is trying to follow in your footsteps, what sort of advice? Would you give one? So are you a new businessman coming to you saying, what do you recommend? What, what should I do? You know, I, I would say the first uh, advice I would give is don't get into it if your sole motivation is becoming wealthy. Yeah, It's really curious. helpful to have a purpose and a reason and a mission behind what you're doing because you're going to get tired and you're going to become frustrated and you're going to be facing obstacles where it's easier to give up if your mission is only to, to to create material wealth, but have something else that motivates you, that transcends that, that you feel like you can't walk away from. It's bigger than just your own self. I think there are three other points I would share. The first is, is that really learn uh, the industry that you're working in and try to get the become the most knowledgeable person you can about the problem that you're trying to solve, the value you're trying to create, and make sure you understand what it is you need to do. And you keep an open mind to adapt and evolve your thinking as you're exposed to new information. Mm -hmm. The second point is, it's gonna be a hundred times harder than you ever imagined. So you better be able to find within you uh, some determination and some passion and be willing to never give up. And I would say kind of tying these concepts together, it means that you have to be willing to make some sacrifices. Mm -hmm. You're not going to work 40 hours a week and build a successful startup. You're not going to be able to have nights and weekends off. And I'm not a fan of trying to uh, preach any sort of methodology around balance. We all have to do what's right for us. I don't think there's any magic formula about that. 
Mm. But for most entrepreneurs that I know and that I work with, they don't separate the day from the night, Friday from weekend. They understand that uh, building a company and really operating uh, in a in a in a uh, high performing way means that you have to make an investment of time and energy that exceeds anything you might have otherwise imagined. So, unless you know that would be sort of the the the, the ideas or, or advice I would share with anyone who's thinking about starting a company. It's wonderful. It's it's a little scary, I imagine, for a lot of people who have thought, well, they'd like to have the end game, but they don't want to do the, the the hard yards. So reality is they have to do the hard yards. That's part of it. It is. And for me, the end game is not the joy of it. The end the yeah. end game is simply a byproduct. The joy that comes, you know, when you have the, and, and this is why it's, uh, I, I, I am so grateful that there are such diversity of human beings on this planet. And those that are programmed to work in environments with incredible structure and a clarity of roles. And so, and I'm not criticizing that. It takes a certain mindset to work in, say, government or or certain types of industries where that rigidity is necessary. And yeah. I love the, the creative type, whether it's a musician or an artist who thrives on the freedom of not having any rules. And I'm not in that extreme. I'm not in the other. But the yeah. point is, we're all different. But to be an entrepreneur, you need a little bit of both. You have to be able to bring structure and good process, and that's important, good process to what you're doing. But you got to be able to think in the wild a little bit. And you got to be able to go beyond sort of the four walls that confine or define you and think beyond that in order to do it. And entrepreneurs that I've met and that I've been built close relationships with, they embody that. And I love that. And I love to be around that. And it's not only the entrepreneurs, but in my company, we attract the same kind of people. Not in, you know, they're all in varying shades of that, uh, of those attributes, but you got to have that. Uh, and that's what drives me. It's this interaction with people and the energy that comes from others. It's fuel that keeps me going, not the end game. Brilliant. And those are, those are superb words to close with. Thank you very much indeed. Thanks, By the Tom. way, do do one thing for me. Send a link to this on, uh, it'll be featured on a YouTube player to your dad. I will. Get him to listen. And <laughs> Thanks, Tony. I, I really would. Gary Palmer, CEO of Pale, founder and uh, entrepreneur. Many, many thanks. My pleasure. Bye-bye.